Oh, come on. Fuel and Emissions Test 11, Fuel Injection System Diagnosis, Chapter 23 of the textbook. I know that the only person in here that probably read that was Lundy, but that's okay. It means, yeah. You're, everybody's supposed to read it, but you're the only one that ever does, see, so. All right. Yeah, huh? Do you ever read it? Because. Do you ever read it? You could, but you didn't, though. Most fuel, port fuel injected engines operate on how much fuel pressure, and that was 35 to 45 is the right answer according to the guy here. But what is it on the Ranger? Anybody ever look it up on the Ranger? I don't know. We've been getting like 50, 50 It's like 70 pounds on the Ranger, and it's, it's just all over the place now. You cannot go by that, okay? Uh, fuel injectors can be tested using what? Any of them. You can do any of that. You can use a stethoscope, an oscilloscope, an ohmmeter, or the little orange pistol grip thing I got that blinks the light when it hears a click. Throttle body fuel injection systems use what type of... Oh, wait a minute. Let me back up. Fuel injectors, let's say fuel injectors can be mechanically and electrically tested, but you will not know if it's delivering fuel or not. I mean, none of these things are going to tell you if it's delivering fuel or not, basically. You got me? I mean, it can actually be clogged up and still click. Now, it will sound a little different if it's not putting enough fuel in there. Uh, throttle body pulse, um, excuse, fuel injection <coughs> system use what type of injector, driver, and that's B, which is peak and hold. You know, basically it pops up there and then it, you know, holds it. It's a strange thing. It's got two little spikes on it. You'll be able to, of course, you're probably, you know, vehicles are getting older. You know, so those, the ones that are throttle body are kind of not nearly as prevalent as they used to be. Port fuel injection systems generally use what type of injector driver? And that is saturated switch. Yeah, there you go. Okay, number, uh, the vacuum hose from the fuel pressure regulator was removed from the regulator and gasoline dripped out of the hose. Technician A says this is normal and everything is okay. Technician B says one or more of the injectors may be defective, causing fuel to get into the hose. Who's right about that? Those guys are both yo-yos. Well, if you pull the... If you pull the vacuum line going to the fuel pressure regulator and you see fuel dripping out of it, the diaphragm in that regulator is ruptured. Yeah, the regulator is ruptured. And it can actually pump enough fuel into the intake and, on it, on, and it can drain down into the cylinder. It's a hydraulic lock, that thing. But, um, if, it's a, if one of the injectors is bad, it's going to back up into these? No, it won't ever go up. And it will never get on top of that diaphragm unless that diaphragm is ruptured. But it will cause the, the diaphragm to rupture? No. But wouldn't that act kind of like a saturated canister and start making you fall on your face? When you no, 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 typically what you're going to have on that is you'll have it either flooded, it won't start at all, or it'll be hard to start, but that uh, fuel coming past that, it can make it, the saturated canister, the reason the saturated canister makes it fall on its face is because your, your canister purge may be working, it may be not. As a matter of fact, in all of these little cells in the algorithms in the engine controller, some of them are considered purge-free cells cells where the purge is not working. So when it goes, when it deals that card for that prevalent set of circumstances uh, on a purge-free cell, it won't be purging in that one. If it switches from a purge-free cell to a cell where purge is purging and the sanitizer, canister is saturated, a lot of times it'll do that at idle on the newer cars. And if it slugs the thing while it's in there idling, that's when it almost stalls and then throws, it back, throws you back in the seat and tries to take off when idle air control catches it. So. Sort of, but this, there, it's not as abruptly happening. It's actually a trickle all the time, which typically gets worse. And what's bad about it is it can get enough fuel in there where it can hydraulic lock the cylinders. I've seen, I've seen that actually destroy an engine. The pressure mm -hmm. Where is that located? It's on the fuel rail, on most of them. Now, the Neon ain't got one because it's returnless. It's regulated in the tank, okay? Some of them are regulated in the tank. Some of them are regulated at the rail. If it's regulated at the rail, you'll see a vacuum line going to a little diaphragm there on the rail. And there are some people that get confused when they see a they see a diaphragm with a vacuum line going through it. They think that's the EGR valve just because it's got a diaphragm with a vacuum line going to it. But there's more than one v, you know component that's the diaphragm with a vacuum line going to it. If you see a little uh, thing on the fuel rail, and I have a fuel rail you know over there, I can show you that on later. Okay. But uh, you'll see it on there. And the, the Broncos got one, and the Ranger has one. And when you pull that vacuum line off, if you're watching fuel pressure, it'll jump up 10 pounds. You put the vacuum line back on, it goes down. I just love this thing. I will call them back. Uh, all right. Let me see what I can do about this here now. Um, let me see. Uh, anyway, number five, uh, neither one of those. Fuel pressure drops rapidly when the engine is turned off. Technician A says one or more injectors could be leaking. 
Technician B says an effective check valve in the fuel pump could be the cause. What do you think about that? That's both right on that. And I tell you what it usually is, what it usually is, is the check valve in the fuel pump. The fuel pressure regulator can cause that too. If the fuel pressure regulator's got something trapped under its little seat, because see the pr fuel pressure pushes that diaphragm, unseats it, and then the return comes out the center of that fuel pressure regulator and goes back to the tank. And if the little piece of trash, like a rust flake or something, gets trapped under that fuel pressure regulator, it'll leak it off too. So it can be going back through the fuel pump, which has got a check valve built into it, it can be going back through the regulator, back through the return, or it can be dripping through the injector. Now, another, the other you know, thing would be it can actually be dripping out of the fuel rail, you know, if it's got an O-ring that's not in good that, for it. Is that sort of like on the, like on the lawnmower carburetor, it's got a little spring and it's got a plastic field over it? Sort of, yeah, but that's a different kind of a thing there. Let's, that basically, that does a different job, okay. but it's a similar deal. Um, but when a fuel, if you're watching, if you got one, in, what kind of a symptom you're going to be looking for when you're checking fuel pressure? If you got one that starts hard when it's hot, like if you're, you know, you crank it up, you drive it, you get it good and hot, you park it, you shut it off, it's supposed to hold good solid pressure within a pound or two of what you shut it off at. Now, if it sits all night, you know, you may see the pressure go away, but it should not leak off fast enough to, call, to enable air bubbles to form in that hot fuel line. Because if it does, you're going to be. Wee! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the escort hosed us pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, however, it can also start hard because of a dripping fuel injector. One fuel injector can drip a little bit. Turn that heat off. One injector can drip a little bit and flood the whole engine. If it puddles up and it gets picked up and it wets all the plugs, it can make it start hard because of one fuel injector dripping. Uh, but or if you start it up and it's running rough, it's like I always say, if you start one up and it's running rough, switch it off while it's still running rough and pull all the plugs out and see if any of them, you know, look either sooty or wet or whatever. And then that's the one. If it's got coolant on it, you know, you had a head gasket problem. If it's got gas on it, you know, you got an injector problem. You hear me? That's how you do that. Shut it off while it's still running bad. Don't wait till it clears up. Shut it off while it's still running bad, and then you got a really good chance of finding it real fast. And uh, now when the bugs are hard to pull out, you just got to suck it up, you know. All right, then. and some of them are, you know. Uh, now, typically, the coolant problem will happen when the engine is uh, worse when the engine is cold, but it can happen when it's hot because my Jeep was doing that because it was seeping a little bit of coolant past the head gasket in there, and it would give me a, it would start skipping and it would give me a misfire on number three when I parked it at Winn Dixie after I drove from Op, you know, and all that. And so, but that wasn't a fuel injector problem, so we need to move on. Um, let me see, uh, in a typical port fuel injection system, which injectors are most subject to becoming restricted? I say the, ones at the, end of the, rail. the ones at the end of the rail on a returnless system or the ones at the bends in the rail? Where it makes it, you know. All right, now, uh, I had one one time, a returnless fuel system on a 95 Dodge van, and the engine was sitting in there like it is on a rear wheel drive vehicle with a slight slant. And this thing was skipping on number one, just skip, 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 skip just skipping all the time. And, uh, that thing drove me up the wall for a while until I recognized the fact that the fuel pump was cavitating, making air bubbles, and they were going to the highest place on the fuel rail, which was right there at number one. See, the number one fuel rail was higher, a little bit higher because of the dynamics of things. It never really got any air in that right-hand bank, but on the left cylinder, left bank, that, would, that air would go up there, and there was an air bubble that was staying at number one all the time. Wow. And it wasn't clear, so I couldn't see in there when I finally figured that out. And I don't even remember how I figured that out. You know, the stuff I figured out, I don't remember how I did it. <laughs> but, I mean, you just there's no good way to figure it out. Basically, you know, you can't look in there and tell what's going on. And if you pull the fuel rail out and try to look at it that way while you pressure up the system or something, or, then you can't, you're changing the angle of the rail. So that's liable to do things, too. So anyway, some kind of way. Well, I need a fuel pump for that. And I had another one that was cavitating. It was a it was sitting in our level and flat. It was in a Lincoln, uh, not a town car, but the uh, Continental. Um, and that darn thing was a '95 model too, I believe. And it was had a because it was cavitating. It had air in the fuel rail. It had a skip that was following the firing order. One, three, seven. My power balance test was showing me that it was five, it would skip on one, three, you know, in order. I called the hotline, and they just totally stumped them. Oh, my gosh, I don't know. Maybe the cam sensor. I'll, I have no clue, you know. And then I got to looking at my fuel pressure gauge, and I noticed it was bouncing, and I pushed that little trigger to let the air out. 
and it and then it quit skipping and it quit. And I said, this thing's cavitating. The fuel pump's pushing air up here. That's what it is, you know. But it was level. It wasn't a little slanted like the Dodge, you know. So anyway, this a returnless fuel system has got is is subject to have problems that return fuel systems don't have. So be pr particularly aware of that. Something else that can happen. On some of these Fords, you've actually got a module that controls the current to the fuel pump to control fuel pressure. It's in the back. It's in the trunk. It's back there. If the inside of that, t I've, I've known of situations where the inside of the tank, the wire that's supposed to be delivering power to the fuel pump in a current controlled pulse will actually short to ground, and the fuel, pr you know, rubbing around in there, and the fuel pump will, you know, spike out, and it'll cause it to have uh, run rich and that kind of stuff. So there's all kinds of little stuff. You know, I can't tell you everything, but you're going to have to learn how to think if you're going to make it in this business. You got me? All right. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Uh, what component pulses the fuel injector on most vehicles? Is that the power control module? Yeah, you know, the powertrain control module is A. Fuel injection service is being discussed. Technician A says the throttle plate should be clean. Technician B says the fuel rail should be clean. Which technician is correct? What do you think? That's Charlie. Now, Sean, pull that motor out of that 95 Neon, and the fuel rail on that 95 Neon is plain old steel. You, what is the fuel rail usually made out of? Stainless steel. And it's a good thing that it's made out of stainless steel. Well, that one was made out of plain old steel on that ratty old Neon. Oh, it, the, it wasn't running all that bad, but he pulled it out, and he put rings in it and all that. And so when he got done with it, uh, the stupid thing wouldn't start. Well, we pulled the fuel uh, injectors out because they were, you know, we, they weren't delivering any fuel when we did the, you know, you, you check, you get the pressure up, you put your little uh, pulse generator on each injector, and it was there was no fuel going through those injectors even though we had pressure. So we pulled them out, and they were all clogged with rust. He had disturbed the fuel rail, and a bunch of rust broke loose on the inside of it, and it clogged the injectors. So we had to pull the fuel rail out and clean it out, kind of like we were having to do this. Malibu, or I mean the Impala cooling system, and put it all back together with some different injectors, and it was okay. Uh, but you can find that. That's one of the reasons that you do injector flow test, but so that you can tell if you've got injectors that aren't delivering, because there's just stuff you can't see with your eye unless you've been able. You got to be able to gather some data that makes sense and then sort that out. You know. Okay, so think about that too. It's always a good idea to have one of those things. And fuel injection service blah. We've already done that one. Sorry, I need to flip over. Uh, if the throttle plate needs to be cleaned, what symptoms will be present regarding the operation of the engine? Yeah, rough idle, hesitation, acceleration, stalls. Ordinarily, hesitation can do it. I mean, you know, you'll see that. Or how many of you guys have ever felt when you put your foot on the gas, alone it's got a throttle cable, it feels like you're standing on a brick and then all of a sudden it pops loose? You ever felt that? I mean, it's a real hard pedal on a gas pedal and all of a sudden, poof, it pops loose. Yeah, yeah that's because the throttle plate stuck because it needs to be clean, and you're breaking the throttle plate loose. And that's one of the reasons that electronic throttle bodies have got their throttle plate open a little all the time, because they don't want you putting your foot on the gas and having the gas go down, and then it won't go, and all of a sudden it breaks loose, and it takes off like a rocket. You know, because that can cause you to plow into the car in front of you or something like that. That's what I wanted to ask you, too. That thing, that's a throttle body that's connected to that, on the top of that range. Of, well, I mean, it has throttle body on the top of it, written across it. You talking about the cable going to it? Or are you doing it? No, it's a little tube about that long and about that That's just yeah, that's just telling you that it that end of that is supposed to connect to the throttle body. And it has a sensor going to it too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean you're talking about yeah, it's the the end of it that goes to the throttle body, that's for assembly. So you can look at it as oh, this goes to the throttle body, you know. They marked it for you. Basically is what you're talking about there. Um what should be done if the fuel pressure regulator will not hold vacuum? <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Did we put one on it. Uh, on a vehicle with a speed density fuel injection system, which of the following is likely to occur with a vacuum leak? That's going to be uh, all of these are correct. Increased engine calculated load, increased MAP sensor voltage, increased idle speed. Um, depending on where the leak is, if the leak is really close to a a uh, injector or something that's liable to go pop, 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 and skip at that injector. If you had a missing O-ring from the bottom of an injector, for instance, if some yo-yo was working on it and the O-ring came off and he just kind of crammed it down in there, which of the following values for IAC count would indicate a vacuum leak on a speed density system? Now, see, there's, this is a, a GM-specific 
uh, stuff when you're talking about IC count. Okay, you're on 13. Five or less. Now, the reason you're on five or less, if the idle air control is trying to correct for a, uh, an idle speed that is higher than what, it is, what the target is, see, there's a target idle speed. And you'll look on a lot of these scan tools, they'll say target idle and then actual idle. If the target and the actual don't match, there's typically a reason for that. You need to find out what it is. You got me? Okay, so if you've got a target, for instance, that's 700 or 750, and there's enough vacuum leaks to keep the idle at 750, even without the idle air control operating, uh, then that's called the dead band. Some people used to jack around with the throttle with an idle stop, throttle stop screw and raise the throttle plate angle a little bit to try to make it idle a little better, you know. And because people like to turn screws and feel see if the engine run different, I don't know why. But anyhow, that particular dead band, if you if you adjust it to the target area, the idle air control is going to go to sleep. You see what I'm saying? It's going to stop doing anything. That's what this is talking about. On a vehicle with a mass airflow injection system, which of the following is likely to occur with a vacuum leak at idle? And that's mass airflow, right? What you got on that? That's going to be a C, a lean fuel mixture. Now, why, why would a mass airflow... Injection system have a have a uh, lean fuel mixture. Because it's not getting the air done. <laughs> no, it's not getting air done. No, I mean, be paying, paying, I mean, watch, you got to be able to explain it scientifically, and not, you know, don't, you don't just jump in there and grab it. <laughs> what do you call that? Whenever there's air getting in that's not being measured by the air, mass airflow sensor. So power out. No, I mean, basically, if it's not being, what's it doing with the mass airflow signal? I mean, what does it use that for? It uses it to calculate fuel delivery, doesn't it? Yeah. It says All right. And if you've got unmetered air coming in from somewhere, like if you take the oil filler cap off, the PCV valve will actually pull unmetered air through the crankcase, and it can cause the fuel trims to go high and lean codes to happen. So remember what an unmetered air leak is. An unmetered air leak is whenever you've got a split in your hose, or if you've got any kind of a leak that's where there's air going through that's not being measured by the mass airflow. That's really important that a mass airflow knows everything that's going in there so it'll know how to ad adequately calculate fuel. I used to take a PCV valve and drill a little hole in the side of it and put it on the Ranger and let everybody go hunting. You know, that's before we even had a smoke machine. That's fun, isn't it? All right, so, you know, but anyway, um, okay, uh, where are we at here? Uh, which of these tools is best to check whether the PCM is pulsing an injector? Uh, you got the same problem I got. Don't you? The Noid light. Huh? The Noid light. That's yeah. The Noid light is really the best. You can build you a Noid light though. That's actually a little light that you just plug into where the injector, unplug the injector wire, plug it in, and it blinks. Just two wires. You know what I mean? Um, Melissa, hand me that box right there behind you. That gray box right behind you. Let me see that box. And uh, this is a fairly, see, this is a deluxe Noid light kit. Okay? Now, if you get in here, you see all these little funky little things? You plug that in to the injector wires, and that little light will blink if the injector's got power going to it. You understand that? And there's various different ones of them in there. Blinks with See? Pulsing. See that? Various different ones. Okay. Yeah, it, it blinks. And so basically, this is made by OTC. It's an old one, you know. And so that's how you can look at it and tell. And you, if you tell if it's flashing, it's got, if it's got power and ground. Now, I'll tell you the problem with the Noid light. If you plug it in and it ain't flashing, you still got to go find out if you don't have a uh, signal coming from your engine controller or if you don't have power coming to that particular injector. You see, so there's some issues in there. Here you go. Take it back. All right, let me see here. Um, what could happen? What could be the problem if a noise light remains yeah. on, does not flash with the engine cranking? What could be the problem? Could it be a, a sh short to ground in the injector circuit or a defective PCM? What they're talking about, now look at this. That's what could be a problem. Well, there's a lot of different problems that you can have on there that can cause that to happen. Uh, if I want it to be really ugly and cause you guys some really serious issues, I could go to the engine controller and I could pop that little wedge out of the engine controller and I could, the, the wire that uh, feeds one of the particular injectors, I could pull it back so that it wasn't touching. 
<laughs> and there'd be no signal coming to that injector at all. Well, your noise light wouldn't blink. So then you're going to say, well, I need to know if I got power in that injector. So you put power to the injector. I mean, you check your test light. Yeah, I got power there, but I don't have a blinking signal. Now I need to go to the engine controller, and I'm going to unplug the engine controller, and I'm going to find that one. And if I find out that that pin's pushed back, because I'm going to have my pin out, then I'll find out it's been push, pushed back. I'm going to put it back in there. I'm going to see if it still runs. I'm also going to look down in the connector, and I'm going to see if that pin broke off or bent or, you know, whatever. Okay, now if I've got, let's say that I pull it out and that pin's not pushed back. What am I going to do next? I remember now, I don't have a signal at the injector. I'm actually gone back to the PCM. I found the wire that's supposed to be feeding that particular injector. What am I going to do? If it ain't pushed back and there's no damage to the wire and there's no damage that I can see to the PCM, what am I going to do next? I'm going back to the the one that plugs into the injector and check and make sure that... Or check the crank signal to see if the PCM gets the signal that it's supposed to. No, there's only one of them that's not working. The rest of them are pushed up in there. Huh? No, I'm actually going to take it right now. I'm going to have my noise light on there. I'm going to leave my noise light on there with the PCM unplugged. I'm going to feed a ground into that pin and I'm going to see if that noise light comes on. If it does, I know the wire is good all the way from the PCM all the way to the injector, and there's something wrong inside the PCM. The driver for that injector is going to sleep. You got me? Mm -hmm. Okay. We need to make. I see. I see. Uh, blank stairs. I see blank stairs. Okay. Yeah, but, but, this is real. Let's try to make this as simple as we can. Okay. Uh, here's a PCM. Now we're not going to make this really complicated, but right here, we've got an injector. Okay, this injector is being fed B plus from somewhere else. It'll be coming from the power relay or the ASD relay if it's a Chrysler or something like that. All right, so the PCM feeds this, right? Okay, I have connected, I've disconnected the injector. It's out of the loop, and I've hooked up my little noise light right here. I'm expecting my noise light to go blink, 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 blink. It don't blink. Then I take my noise light out of the loop, and I take my test light, hook to ground, and I see power right here with the key on. Coming from the battery. Coming from the battery. You know, when the key's on, it's actually coming through a switch from the battery. Mm -hmm. All right, now then, there's a couple of ways I can do this. I can use my noise light for this, or I can take my test light and put it right here and hook it to B+. Plus. Hook that to B+, B plus so that if I see a ground on this, that's going to come on, right? I'm going to come over here. I'm going to take this connector loose from the PCM, and that particular thing, I'm going to feed a ground in there. That light should come on. If it doesn't come on, I know that this is broke. The wire's bad. The wire bad. Got it? You understand where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Something else that's important is pin fit. Does the pin slide snugly onto its connector, or is it loose in there because somebody has jammed a test light up in it and spread it out? There's all kinds of stuff you got to think about. You can get a set of drill bits. You know those numbered drill bits? And you can find a number of drill bits that's exactly the same size as your terminal, and you can actually check for pin fit that way. On a lot of these GM cars, one of the Delco instructors was saying that if you unplug the uh, a GM car, uh, some of the connectors, and plug them back in four times, you're going to start having trouble with pin fit. Brilliant. You know, outstanding performance. That's, you know, that's uh, made in China or something? I don't know, whatever. All right, so let me see here. Uh, which one? 17. Technician A says all the fuel injectors on an engine should have the same electrical resistance. Technician B says the difference between any two injectors should be less than 2 ohms. That's actually going to be uh, A. Going to be A. Who was that that asked me the other day, why would you check the resistance on an injector? Who was that? Some, huh? That was you, wasn't it? That was a good question. And I was telling him about a Jeep I was working on that came in and it was skipping. Bup, 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 bup. And I listened to that injector, number three or whatever it was, and it was dark. I mean, it, you know, it was skipping on three. Injector wasn't clicking. That's important. So pay attention. All right. So I have another engine controller because there was a bunch of them that were, had a, they had a misguided recall where we changed a bunch of engine controllers we didn't need to change. And Jeep, you know, wanted us to. And so I would just plug one of those in and see what would happen. I plugged it in, and initially it started running just fine, and then it dropped that injector out again. And I said, that's interesting. So I checked the resistance of the injector. They should have had 16 ohms, and the one that was giving the trouble had three. See, it, had, it, would, it could work, but it was putting too much of a load on that uh, driver in the uh, Jeep uh, engine controller, that Bendix engine controller, 
and it would sit there and it would it would it would shut that injector when that engine could, when that driver started heating up it would shut it down I mean it shut that you know and so I said all right so we got to put an injector in there so we did that now there's another time that can happen if you hear an injector that's not clicking and it's skipping on that cylinder then it could be skipping for some other reason and the PCM will shut that injector down to keep from damaging the catalytic converter and see if you can see what the mentality I'm thinking about it's not clicking. I'm not getting a signal. I got a good connection all the way to my PCM. That means the PCM is bad. Not always. Because if the PCM sees a misfire for any reason on that cylinder, it's going to shut down that injector on the newer vehicles. Because it's important to the manufacturer that this 80,000 mile warranty $650 catalytic converter is not destroyed by something that has gone on up here in the engine compartment. You don't want a vacuum leak causing fuel to go in there that's not being burned or whatever, you know what I'm saying, or anything wrong like that, bad spark plug, you know. All right, so just because the injector's not clicking and you're not getting a signal from the PCM, don't just throw a PCM on it, because sometimes those are $2,000. You know, you don't want to play that game. Uh, just bad news, man. All right, let me see here. Um, let's see, all the following statements are correct except fuel injectors are on a, uh, on a gang, wire, gang fire system or wired in series. Think about what that's saying. That's the one that's wrong. Yeah. They're not wired in series. They're wired in parallel. Yeah, uh, you got other one lower than specified injector resistance means the injector is shorted, which is what I had. The resistance of a group of injectors that fire at the same time can be tested together. That's right, too. Uh, number 19. During a fuel injector pressure drop test, the difference between any two fuel injectors should not exceed what? Okay. During a fuel injector pressure drop test, the difference between any two fuel injectors. Now, how, what are we talking about when we say a fuel injector pressure drop test? We're basically going to pressure up our fuel system with a gauge on it. We're going, and it's got to be holding fuel. It can't have a bad check valve in the pump. It's got to be holding solid. You know, boom, 40 pounds. Let's say it's like on the old mobile. Uh, and then we got this little thing, and it actually is going to pulse the injector for half a second. It's an electronic box made by OTC. costs about $100. Hook it up to the battery. Plug it into the injector with all the wires unplugged from all the injectors. I'm watching my pressure. I push the button. You know, how much pressure does it lose in a half a second? You got me? Got me? That's how it work. All right, then you move to the next one. Pressure it up to 40 pounds again. Push the button again. How much pressure does it lose? Move it to the next one, and you're going to write all these down. There's actually a worksheet in, in Engine Performance 1 where we do this. All right, so when you get through with all of that, you're going to know if each one of these injectors is capable of delivering the same amount of fuel with exactly the same pulse. Now, you can't do this manually because you're actually not going to be, you know, as accurate as this little box is. And it'll either pulse it for a half a second, it'll give you 10 five-second pulses, or it'll give you 100, you know, five-millisecond pulses or whatever. Okay, so you, so you got to take when you move to the next, you got to unplug this one. Unplug this one, plug in the next one. You plug in your little box into it. Okay. So your little box is what's operating the injector, and you're seeing how much pressure is dropping. Now, the machines that do this, like this SBDS machine, it actually had a pre-programmed pressure drop that it was sh shooting for. And it would measure how long it took that injector to drop the pressure 10 pounds or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it would actually say it took this one 500 milliseconds to drop it 10 pounds, but all the rest of them dropped it in 220 milliseconds, so one of them is stopped up, or if it's dropping more, see. All right, so anyway, there's a bunch of ways you do that. Um, technician A always uses a special service tool to pulse fuel injectors. 1.5 PSI, that's what it is, that's, that's A. Technician A says a special, uses a special service tool to pulse fuel injector. that's what I was just talking about. Technician B says that the injector for each cylinder should only be floor, floor Flow tested four times without starting the engine. Who's right about that? Oh. Yeah, technician A. Actually, four times is too many, guys. <laughs> you don't want to go that many times because you're going to flood it. Okay. All right. Let me restart my camera here. All right. All of these are types of injector circuits except A, pulse width modulated, B, or saturated switch, C, peak and hold, oh. or all of them are. 21. That's, that's, that's a D. 22. When looking at a solenoid with an oscilloscope, what event often follows applying or removing power from the coil windings? Now we've seen that on a scope before, guys. I don't know if you knew what you were looking at. Voltage spike. What you're going to do is you're going to see this is your 12 volts. This is when it's pulled to ground. This right here is how long it stays open. Then you see that. 
That's like a 50 volt spike that comes out of there. The reason that 50 volt spike comes out of there, it collapses that magnetism that's in there, sweeps across the winding, and it's like a little ignition coil. <laughs> you know, it's baked for the same reason. That's something they use. Um, so let me see. Uh, how much voltage is generally available to fuel injectors? Five volts. Battery voltage. That's what I said. Battery voltage. On the... Uh, on the power stroke diesel, it's 115 volts, unless it's a 6 liter, and then it's like 48 volts, unless it's a Duramax, and then it's like 93 volts. You know, so that, that those diesels have got more voltage going to the injectors. Don't ask me what it is on a Cummins, because I used to know, but I don't remember. All right, let me see. Um, let's see. What uh, term does, describes the electrical current flow in the opposite direction when an injector coil is energized? Inductive, Inductive reactants is a good answer. Give that man a cigar and what's behind door number two. Okay, which of these symptoms are carbon are carbon carbon buildup? Which are little little? Which of these are symptoms of carbon buildup on the throttle plates? Yeah, everything's right. Technician A says if fuel pump pressure is correct, fuel pump volume will be correct as well. Is that true? Not necessarily. Technician B says the fuel pump may produce specified pressure, be below specified volume. He's B is right on that one. Uh, inject, injection cleansing machine is being discussed. Technician A says the applied pressure should be between 75 to 90 psi before starting the engine. Technician B says to pressure clean the fuel system using a two to one mixture of solvent to gasoline. Which technician is correct? That's actually A. Um, Technician A says an, uh, an engine benefited from system cleaning if the manifold vacuum and idle increases. Technician B says cleaning the throttle plate and IAC passages will benefit many engines. Uh, who's right about that? Yeah, tw let's see, both those guys are right about that. Uh, the following statements are all correct except what? A. a, relearning the PCM should never be attempted. <laughs> yeah, that's not a correct statement. Uh, the uh, B, C, and D are fuel systems that have never been cleaned, may have developed whack deposits as well as carbon. Uh, on engines operating poorly, the PCM should be relearned after fuel system cleaning. The fuel rail and pressure regulators should be cleaned as well as fuel injectors. Well, yeah, uh, but, you know, how do you clean a fuel rail? You know, that's basically going to happen while you're cleaning the fuel injectors. Which of the following describes reasons for poor engine performance in the cold? Mm -hmm. What do you think? All of these are great. Insufficient fuel volume, contaminated fuel, low fuel pressure, one more thing. One more thing. If you run a premium fuel in a car that's supposed to have regular, it'll pop and cut up and backfire out the intake. You know how disgusting it is to go through doing a whole bunch of work when you didn't even check your fuel quality? <laughs> I mean, it's real easy to get in trouble with that. Because fuel quality is the last thing you think about all the time. Of course, in this place, we, what we think about is when one quits running, we always say, out of gas, you know. Now, we have had them where there was another problem, and keep, people keep pumping gas in it, trying to get it started, and they give it a good old full tank of gas, and it still won't start, see? So, that's not good. All right. Technician A says the fuel system should be diagnosed in a, uh, first in a no-start condition. Technician B says the ignition system trigger device is used to synchronize fuel injection. Yeah, that's C, basically. Uh, both of them. Something else you need to know, uh, too, anytime you're, uh, you've got a power loss problem that you're suspecting is fuel pressure, uh, there's a couple of ways you can check that. Let me tell you this, because we're talking about fuel injection, and I've, I've mentioned this before. Let's put our fuel pressure gauge on there. I used to do this on motorhomes all the time. People come in with a motorhome. Oh, this was rich. They'd come in with a motorhome with 80 gallons of gas in a tank, because it started, you know, cutting up and running bad, and they'd fill it up with gas. First thing they do, 80 gallons of gas, big giant gas tank, big as that table there, you know. All right, so they come in there, and I'd take the engine cover off, and I'd put a fuel pressure gauge on it, and I'd pull the line off the vacuum, uh, the vacuum line off the fuel uh, pressure regulator, and watch that fuel pressure and snap the throttle. And if I snap the throttle and the pressure drops, I know I've got a weak fuel pump. Now, you might want to put a filter on it first just to be sure, but typically it's going to be the fuel pump when you do that. If, uh, in that particular case, so you've got an 80-gallon gas tank and you've got to pull this 80-gallon gas tank off, we don't have anything that's going to hold 80 gallons of fuel. <laughs> right? Ooh. So basically, I came up with a way to lower the tank without, you know, having to take the fuel out of it because this thing's right on the top of it anyway, you know. Uh, make sure is everything. Make sure that if you have to work under something like that, you don't get in a position where you're breathing a lot of gas fumes. I used to put a little squirrel cage fan up there, blowing the gas fumes away from me when I was having to work on something like that, because you don't breathe a lot of those because it kills brain cells. Most of us don't have any any to spare. Uh -huh. you know. Whenever you breathe a lot of gas, it kills brain cells. You know. Yeah. 
Which of these service procedures is being done in the uh, fuel pressure? Yeah, we're measuring fuel pressure. That is not a difficult question to answer as they were measuring fuel pressure. Okay. Especially considering we've been talking about fuel the whole time. Yeah, there's nothing in the oil. Yeah, the, does the word duh mean anything to you? That's the kind of stuff that you would put on. I will tell you this though, on ASC tests, you will see little line art drawings of hands doing something to a particular part that if you knew anything you'd be able to identify and they'll say what is the technician doing in this picture and that'll be a you know it'll be you know and I had one of them one time this is really weird this guy had a I mean to me it was this guy had this thing he was holding in his hands it looked almost like a, a sawzall and it had a cord coming off of it and he was dragging it down through a seam <laughs> And they said, what's the guy doing in this picture? Well, basically what he was doing, he was, he was getting ready to replace the windshield, and he had this heat and iron that he was dragging oh, down. Really? Yeah, oh. and I was, yeah, it took me a second, man. I almost got thrown on that one, you know. But uh, anyway.